I'm very intrigued by this relationship that you have when you're looking at paintings, particularly old master paintings that you see hanging in museums. And a lot of them you can have a very immediate relationship with. They're human beings and they're standing, talking, doing things. But sometimes when they're presented to you in the context of a museum, the um, trappings, the framework where the pictures are displayed can sometimes color the way that you're looking at the works. You're looking at painting in an ornate Baroque frame in a marble-covered room inside a museum that's extremely beautiful in a city that itself is embellished to such a degree that you can't really see the painting anymore. And your relationship to it is kind of distorted and corrupted by these all these other influences around it. And trying to go back to thinking about what the painter was thinking when he was making the picture and what the person that was posing for the picture was thinking and doing at the time it was executed. So this is Camberwell. London Bridge over this area here, Bermondsey. And over this area here, that's the main body of Camberwell. Peckham's up and coming art area, just over that direction. Brixton over here. And then London is straight down that way. So this place used to be the living quarters of a pub which was about 20 years ago. When I first came to London, went to Goldsmiths College, which is about two minutes over there. That's where everybody went at that time, all the artists that became uh, kind of more successful over the years. So we used to come and drink in all the pubs around this area, and it's kind of strange to be back in this place, which used to be one of the nearest pubs to the Goldsmiths College. So down here are various bits and pieces that I've worked on and maybe work that didn't quite happen or the works that have come back because they've been damaged and I have to repair them. I've got a space for cutting paper, storing prints. This is some of the mirror that I use quite a lot. Take this upstairs to show Will. This is a model. I've never seen you make a model. This is like a model, so basically I had the idea to make it. So the show that I'm doing is it's basically it's, it's a work that has to reflect somehow the collection in Villa Borghese. So first I went with three Caravaggio paintings. I wanted to re-experience them, or certainly the person, people who go into the gallery to re-experience those three paintings. Just yeah. have a little shift in the way you look at them. And then another space came up in the downstairs area yeah. of Gallery of Borghese, a yeah. uh, huge space. The place is very busy with inlaid marble and sculptures and frescoes. The light comes in and it just shimmers around there. It dances with light yeah. and bodies, flesh everywhere. And there was a painting of the Massacre of the Innocents upstairs yeah. in the gallery by kind of a minor painter. So and not thought, by Caravaggio? Not by Caravaggio, but I thought it would be a nice kind of um, an antidote to the Caravaggio. So with the Massacre of the Innocents, I decided to make it into a three-dimensional zoetrope, which is an optical illusion. Yeah. I'm not sure if you're familiar with yeah. it. When they go in and we glue them, 
they're not coming out again, right? But what if I wanted to put them in, spin it, and then take them out again? For example, paintwork. If the paintwork wasn't right, take them off, paint them, put them back on again. That's kind of tricky, right? Mm. So there's a woman here right. and a man here. So that looks like that's two characters there. There's a big pile of babies here. And then there's one guy lifting babies from the pile and throwing them through the window so that they come down in front of this pillar here and down into this central space. Every section is exactly the same. With the figures, every figure is slightly different. So one figure might be like this, and the next figure will be like this, and the next like this. So this is just a cardboard thing. It will be made in resin, and there'll be lights under here and in the dome. These lights will be stroboscoping, they'll be flashing. Okay. So as it spins round, the light flashes. These figures will cover the base and the upper tier, and it will create an illusion so of So it's going to be quite hectic. Exactly, the very, whole... very hectic. It's going to be an orgy of violence. Oh. oh. Ecco qua, siamo. by Caravaggio to work with, partially because of the realism, the way that they're painted. They look almost photographic. They look like they could have been painted yesterday. And also partially because when you look at these paintings, your eyes move around the figures inside the image. Everything other than the figures is black. So you're immediately engaged with the characters inside the pictures. And you're reflecting on the fact that it's a person, a human being, that's standing there in front of you, posing for a picture, looking back at you as you stand in the position of the painter, looking at them, observing them, and then documenting them, making a picture out of them that's going to exist across that bridge of time between then when it was painted and us looking at the painting. So it's like they're kind of behind the mirror. They're on the other side of this space and time. now in Murano because the frames for these pictures I wanted to be made from glass made here. So I wanted to make something that somehow mimicked that decorative nature of the frame, but also something that reflected on the way that the pictures actually looked, that they looked like moments frozen in time. So I'm making my ornate frames from black glass. And the black glass giving a slightly malevolent feel to it. It's like looking through the window at the night, petrified in the forms of these glass black leaves. Hello. John Omastra. Okay. okay, good. Hmm. What do you think? It's 
just maybe a little bit. I think we need a mold for these leaves here. This is not very good. I need like a master's no, no, touch. No, no, no. So we could try and make these little bits here sì, by hand. Yes, 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 yes. Leo, what the color? What the color? Um, black, nero. Uh, 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 but, but we can do it in fire. I think we don't have black. 27 is nero. 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 A momento niente. Niente. Al momento no. Qua no, facciamo una cosa fatta a mano. Vuole okay. fare delle cose fatte a mano. Via via. Voglio tutta molti. that I wanted to animate and represent inside Villa Borghese, David and St. Jerome and the Madonna with the child. They're in some way a reflection on mortality and I have represented them as subtly animated images which appear from behind a mirror, the mirror that's a reflection of the real world but not part of it. It's a space that we can't access first room that you enter as you go upstairs onto the first floor. So my first work was going to be right here in the centre of the room facing towards the door that you enter and this was going to be the largest of the three works which I think is going to be the David with the head of Goliath. So that will be shimmering behind a mirror. It's going to be kind of ghost-like. It goes down a step. Yeah, down a step. like this. Right? So, so like we, 40, 50 centimeters. Just remember that. There's no way we can go over that. The paintings that I chose are ones that I covered the widest spectrum of people, really. So you have a young child, a woman, a young man, an older man, an older woman, and a very old man. They're all reflecting and they're all looking at something. So they're all involved in the act of looking and meditating on death, metaphysics, as we are looking at them and ourselves meditating on the picture that we're looking at. So we are meditating on them, meditating on something else. This is there, and then this. Okay, you work it out. Yeah, maybe. Too big. Yeah. No. Too grand. Yeah, that's it. Like, like the other one is smaller. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think it's pretty good. Okay. Bene. The Caravaggio works are animations of these models in the studio waiting while Caravaggio was painting them. So I've rebuilt them on the computer and then they're just slight movements of breathing or a hand trembling. And then these videos are played back from behind a two-way mirror. So it's like kind of um, looking back into the past behind these mirrors to this little sliver of time when these people still had a fragility about them because they were living, breathing, 
pulsing human beings at the time when he painted them. They were then transformed into these icons. I want to go back to that little moment when they were, they were there, these, these humble people being painted them. This is the Bramante Chapel that my architecture is based loosely on. I looked online and saw lots of little temples, and this one was probably by far the most simple structure. It's kind of, I think, about 500 years old, so it's a long time after King Herod. And it's supposed to be the place where St. Peter was crucified. He was uh, crucified upside down on his own request, oddly. And what I've done was removed this shell and introduced a second circle of pillars so that you get a little bit of parallax so that there's kind of a perspective going between the two pillars going into the whole design. Well, I, I think it's a place where you come to remember and it's a place where you come to mourn. It's not a place of worshipping the God, it's just a place of remembering people making the sacrifices and dying. From here, it looks like almost like the School of Athens, um, just with the, the people sitting on the steps uh, and the large columns. I have seen it, and when it is go around, and the, the figures they move. Figures around seem, they seem to, to fall. There's a lot of movement in the characters. There's people peering over the um, the banister over the railing. Uh, so, I mean, I imagine with the strobe light, it's probably really pretty uh, intense. Kind of baby dropping from the balcony and showing what I've been told that it later is gonna spin like, a, like it's gonna be like an animation. And I think it's a very beautiful setup. This work is based on a painting that's upstairs. It's like a minor painter. It's not a particularly well-known one. It's kind of hidden a little bit in the gallery. When you look at paintings of the Massacre of the Innocents, you have no point to really settle your eye on. There's no focal point, and your eye keeps moving around the picture. And so it generates this feeling of anxiety as you're looking at it. Your eye moves from one man to a woman to a baby, and it can never really stop moving around generating anxiety as you look at it. So what I wanted to do is to exaggerate that feeling in this work that I'm making here. What happens is you've got about four or five hundred different characters. The whole thing is going to rotate and there'll be a light strobescoping to make all of these figures move. And when you look at it, it'll be hopefully quite compelling to look at. But you won't really be able to focus on any one point. So the works basically should exaggerate the kind of feeling that I get when I'm looking at the paintings here in the collection. 
the Caravaggio works, they're a lot more introspective. to make uh, um, a theme that you were kind of engaged in and if it was just maybe like a guy with a dog which I've done before it's kind of interesting but I wanted to make something that you immediately become quite uh, hypnotized by and then you kind of realize that the subject matter is really quite violent and uh, it's quite appalling I think like uh, generally human beings are quite attracted by violence anyway and they like to experience it vicariously through paintings or um, mosaics or video games, cartoons, films. This is originally where we were going to have the Madonna de Palafinieri, but it's very problematic with moving the furniture. So this is where we're going now. No, I come here and now I go there. So I haven't seen it there. No. Are you finished? Yeah. Really? So this will be David with the head of Goliath on this point here. What does it feel like as, as an artist when you're painting, when you're standing with your brush in front of the canvas and you know in some way, shape or form you are taking on the canon? You are, you know, these guys are in your mind. You know what they've done. You know, this is a perfect example that you, you know, they're in your, they're in your soul in a way. You can't escape them. Um, and in a way, when you, as you say, using modern materials, you, you, it's kind of liberating. But when you find you're standing at a canvas with your brush in hand, is it intimidating? I think very intimidating, yeah. You're dealing with, uh, as you say, the history of art, but it's also the metaphysical question of, you're, you're making an assertion, assertion of being here. You have a void and you make a mark on that void. It's your presence yes. that you're symbolizing with that mark.
uh, used eye tracking software on all of these Caravaggio paintings. So I have a map of the way the human eye moves around the painting. And then I've compared that to the 88 star constellations and found the nearest one to that movement of the eye around it. And I think the titles are going to be taken from the constellation that best matches the movement of the eye around the picture. But it's also like when you look at the stars, they kind of, there isn't really those constellations, right? It's what the human mind says, okay, we're going to link that one with that one with that one, and we're going to project an image onto this infinite randomness. So it's that human desire to find something to hang on to, find some image that we can understand and label and therefore give ourselves meaning. When Caravaggio painted them, he went into the studio and he worked, I don't know, a day, a couple of days, bam, knocked them out very quickly. And it was almost as though he was channeling some kind of divine inspiration. And then suddenly this old man at the table became this iconic image of St. Jerome. There's that transformation that went on. Suddenly he went from being a, a mortal person to an immortal, a saint, in the act of painting. So it is a mirror that you're looking at there, but it's a two-way mirror. It's a kind of um, translucent piece of glass if there's an equal amount of light on both sides, and it becomes a mirror if there's no light on one side. And on that principle, I started making these works where I have, like, flat-screen TVs behind the two-way mirror so that when it's just black on the TV screen, it's just a mirror, and then when there's light on the TV screen, it comes through the mirror. Do you think, Matt, you'll, you'll ever settle on a style? You've kind of, as we discussed, settled on a subject. This idea of life, death, religion, violence. That's kind of been a theme right through your work. But you've tackled it in so many different mm. ways, shapes and forms, literally. Do you think there will ever be a time where Matt Collishaw becomes focused on a Matt Collishaw type of work? Mm. I hope not. I mean, it's possible, but I don't. I don't want to become like kind of myself repeating myself. Like all a the Lichtenstein, time. who just basically wants it. Which down. I love. Yeah, and yeah. a Warhol house style, just bang them out. Bang them out. Thing. For, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I think I'm doing making art because I'm a voyeur and I'm fascinated by images of things. As you're probably thinking, same thing, different size. So it's pretty much the same design, it's just a little bit smaller. I think the reason was why I originally did it is because I wanted to reflect the museum inside the works. So, and I'm just fascinated with it, by, the, by that inaccessible space that the picture shows you. You know, it's like a, it's like a landscape there with an arch and the things and you're drawn into it, but it's, it's just nothing. It's a flat surface you're looking at, and it's an inaccessible space. Quite effective when painters like Caravaggio use death, because death is that thing that's lingering on the other side. We'll see what it's like when it's finished.
necromancer, to have a relationship with the dead, to reawake the dead. It's not specific what to do with them, but to revisit them by awakening them. It's like a magical phenomenon. It's to purposely set out to cross the threshold of life and death and to embrace what's on the, the other side, to awaken it, to bring life to it.